Hey everybody, welcome back to the Modern Customer Podcast. I'm your host, Blake Morgan. Today on the show is Isabella Valani. She is the author of the book, Transform Customer Experience. It's an excellent book that I read myself recently in doing some research and I just felt that it was so well organized and well written and an amazing overview of customer experience. She is an author, speaker, and advisor. Um, Isabella is the managing director of Exceed Global. That is Australia's leading privately owned customer experience firm. Please enjoy Isabella Villani. Isabella, welcome to the Modern Customer Podcast, all the way from Melbourne, Australia, one of my favorite cities. How's the weather in Melbourne this morning? Uh, it'll change in about 30 seconds, but right now it is drizzly and terrible. Oh. But we've had lovely weather over the past few days of 29, 30 degrees, um, which is beautiful beach weather, and now it's miserable and, yeah, rainy, spitting rain. Oh, my goodness. The rain that stops you from getting out and about. Yeah. Well, I love Melbourne and I love customer experience. So we have so much to talk about today. Um, I picked up your book. We were just chatting that someone gave me your book and he found it in the library at his company and he thought, which is free for employees. And he thought I would enjoy it. And I really did enjoy it. I felt like it was just such a wonderful summary and guide for customer experience practitioners. Let's go back to the beginning. How did you get started in this fun space of customer experience? Yeah, um, I fell into this space thanks to a drunken friend. Oh. Um, so I, um, my background is speech pathology and I specialised in augmentative and alternative communication, so speech recognition technology, that sort of thing. And I went to a friend's house to go shopping and she was very hungover from a big night out. Mm -hmm. And so while I was waiting for her to get ready, her uncle started speaking to me and he was a CIO of a tech company that was implementing speech recognition technology in corporate settings. So he said, we really need to understand the user interface design and how we can interact with customers over the phone more. So back in the days, they're shutting branches and stores and a lot more things were moving online. So um, he gave me his business card and said, if you're ever sick of being a speech pathologist, um, send me an email and I researched his, the company and I was really intrigued and I did a resume and the next thing I know I was in a IT sort of contact centre role de designing speech rec technology and also advising customers on human psychology about getting people to be more comfortable interacting on the phone and on the agent side of things, teaching them soft skills and all those training that sort of went beyond process and technical information. And then here I am today running my own company since 2011. So big leapfrog. Wow. So talk about XC Global. I assume that's the company you're talking about. What is it? How many employees do you have? What do you guys do and all of that? Yeah. Um, so we um, have about, we have three key elements of our business. So we do advisory, which is really our consulting arm. And in that space, we do a lot around CX strategy, um, sort of transformation more at an enterprise wide level. So really embedding CX in a sustainable manner. So making CX, I call it sticky um, and sprinkling CX varied up um, across the organization. So that's really what we focus on. Then we have an um, another arm that is actually um, recruitment. So we, you know, that view I have in my book around you can't have a great CX without a great EX. Mm -hmm. So we decided that how can we help our clients source the right talent? Because we're asked all the time, we need help on our journey long term beyond the consulting engagement. So now we provide recruitment services in that space. Um, and then finally, we do training and coaching. So we have training programs that we run publicly as well as bespoke in-house programs. And right now we're sitting at about 50 people and we do a lot of work with basically all the big logos in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, so we work in government, telco, financial services. So, yeah, That's I love exciting. it. I love, love, love going to work every day. 
Wow. Not many people say that. <laughs> yeah. And you know, there's not, I guess there are more CX design shops that pop up, but there's not like that many that are strictly customer experience. Let's talk about the the vibe in Australia, what's happening in business there and customer experience. You and I were saying before we um, started recording that you think it's a little different in Australia versus the rest of the world or America. Could you just talk about why you think it's different? Yeah. Um, I think the biggest thing is scale. Um, so for organizations, um, to get a business case up, like the ROI to stack up Mm -hmm. um, is a little more challenging because we're not as, our population isn't as big as the US. So I think that's one of the key things to think about. Um, The other thing is we are extremely, an extremely diverse, amazing, beautiful, multicultural country. Um, And we do really embrace um, different um, I suppose values, culture. So building that into how we deliver CX is really important for our customers. Um, and I think that's something um, I see more and more here in Australia. And we tend to be a little bit more receptive to try new things. Yeah. So we tend to be good at, you know, that pilot location, that test bed, um, see how we go. And we're very forgiving with organisations Um Yeah, I think that's one thing. We may complain, but we're probably a little bit more forgiving, I'm generalising here, um, around how um, we approach things. And we don't have as much choice in regards to companies as, say, you would in the US. For example, if you wanted to change your energy retailer, um, you would have far more options in the US than we would here in Australia. So I feel like we kind of dance around to the different ones. Mm -hmm. We switch easily, but then we don't have that many options. So we tend to say rather than goodbye, see you later. Mm -hmm. Bella, would you say that Australian companies are happier to take risks than in other parts of the world? Yeah. Um, Every organization I think in Australia is going through some form of digital transformation. Mm -hmm. Um, We are compared organizations are compared against organizations that do digital well Mm -hmm. not their competitors so everyone's sort of struggling not struggling but trying to keep up um i'm seeing a lot more around you know chatbots and virtual assistants um coming into organizations and even the more traditional organizations for example local government that i've seen in the past So I'm seeing people offering different service channels and trying to work out how that fits in in their organisation. There's a lot more around data-driven insights and and what we do with being more proactive around communication. Um, I often speak to customers about the best customer experience is nothing at all, no experience at all. Because if we think about um, our customers in some companies, they're usually ringing because something's not wrong, not right, not clear, um, or they're changing and we need to understand that. So I think a lot more around technology to drive data decision making is is sort of coming more at the forefront. Um, also understanding that whole omni-channel strategy, that interaction that customers have with multiple channels and touch points, looking at how do we enhance that, factor that in. So really sort of, you know, putting aside that silo-driven approach um, is something um, that I think is important. And I don't know if you've read much in the news about Australia, but we've had huge data breaches, big companies in health, um, in the health insurance sector, in the telco sector where people's um, personal information has but has, it has been breached and it's out in the ether. People um, overseas threatening that if payments aren't made, people's medical records are going to be made public, for example, those who have chosen to terminate a child or those who have cancer sort of go out in the ether. So as consumers and customers, we're really conscious about how our data is stored and what we share. Mm-hmm. So... Um, you know, you think about those outbound calls when an organisation rings us and then goes, oh, to continue, we need to identify you. You know, people are a lot less willing to go, sure, I'll tell you my date of birth and I'll give you my account number to tell you that I'm me. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I can see that shift as well. Okay. Um, so if they're not willing to tell you that, like, what do you, how do you identify them in other ways? 
Um, well, there are other ways where they're saying we'll send you a text, we'll send you a link or, you know, but they're sort of asking organisations to prove that you are the person that you say you okay, are. Yeah. And now people are questioning a lot more, like, why do you need to have this information? Or particularly um, with one of the telcos, what, why did you store the information? So once you've identified me, is it absolutely necessary that you keep that information, particularly when I've moved on? Mm-hmm. So let's talk about some of the big challenges that you're seeing your clients struggle with. At least in America, um, analysts say that customer experience budgets have been cut. The companies that don't want to invest are cutting. The companies that understand how amazing customer experience can be as a business accelerator are investing, but those are few and far between. What are you seeing for your clients? What are they struggling with? Yeah. Um, aging technology and the constraints around technology are something I see consistently. Um, the other thing um, is around CX customer experience and you'll have seen in my book a whole chapter around culture customer experience extends beyond you know the contact center or the marketing team so where does that cx role fit in an org structure so to speak but also if they really do own customer experience how to ensure that changes in the organization um, that will impact customers are kind of factored in from a cx perspective so I feel like um, organisations are sort of understanding that customer experience is really, really important, but then how do they make sure that every single person in the organisation is a ambassador of their organisation? They understand that bigger picture rather than that siloed or departmental approach. That is definitely something, pardon me, I see as a challenge. And another thing is really we know how we deliver an excellent customer experience, but we can't quite afford that, um, whether it be the people, the process or the technology. So, um, you know, you get all these people really excited about CX across the organisation and then they feel constrained and it's really getting that balance right to go, well, let's do the best with what we've got available and also, um, you know, Throwing shiny toys, you know, technology at a problem isn't always the answer, especially if we don't think about how we implement that technology and integrate it across the other customer channels and touch points. But we are feeling that fatigue of lockdown. I don't know if you saw how long we were in lockdown in Australia, yeah. particularly here in Victoria. It was really tough. We're seeing that on the economy. And also, how do we deliver a great customer experience when our, still a lot of our work workforce are working remotely. We haven't all come back into the office, even though we can. So it's sort of adapting to the modern workplace. So you are somewhat of a technologist. I mean, you clearly speak the language and you can create a strategy for a company. In your eyes, what is a customer experience technology stack? Would you be able to speak to what that includes? Um, I'm by no means a technology, but I can talk about how to be implemented. My ideal technology stack is before we put something else on the stack, we look at the technology we've got now available to our customers and we're optimising that. So I think we need to stabilise before we then sort of add to that stack. But at the moment, um, you know, we think about the telephone channel. I'm still not convinced we our customers really, really want to pick up the phone and ring us. I think sometimes they're ringing us because they can't do something on another channel yet. The process restricts them. They reach that, sorry, please call us to do whatever it is you need to do or come into a branch to do whatever you need to do. For example, I wanted to close an account. I had to go in in person to actually do that. I couldn't do it on another channel. So I feel like our technology chat um, stack and our processes and our business rules to be allowing customers to interact at the channel in the channel of their choice at a time that suits them, that's convenient for them. So my ideal tech stack would see things like sexy analytics, lots of proactive analytics, uh, um, chat because people want to um, use a chat platform. I'm personally in the world of Bella, not a huge fan of email. It is expensive, it is clunky, it is slow. Yeah. I see a lot of customers switch channels because they're just over it, they're impatient, 
and they want that instant gratification, that instant response. And, um, you know, and it's kind of been messed up a little bit by things like templates where agents go, oh, that template kind of matches that inquiry. So I'll send it in without looking at what is exactly in that question and how do we tailor it in a language that the customer can understand. So response times, confusing messaging, incomplete um, responses that really impact first contact resolution. So I would have it there as a channel, but I'd look at how I'd really optimise that channel. Um, phone, where appropriate, face-to-face, because -face. there's still some people that want to do things face-to-face, -face, particularly around things like health. Um, you know, people do want to come in and speak to someone face-to-face. They still like that remote aspect, but there's elements I still think that face-to-face -face communication just has this energy, this vibe, you know, mm -hmm. it's a completely different experience. So my tech stack would have quite a lot of things and then I'd have a little pretty bow on it with amazing reporting and dashboards. So I choose my voice to the customer program to focus on questioning and a style that doesn't... Um, have questions or things that I can see the data is going to tell me that answer anyway. So my um, my voice of the customer technology that I add on my stack is enhancing the, the data, the CX success metrics. I noticed once someone else in your podcast had spoken about metrics and called them experience SL, um, mm -hmm. instead of service agreements. Um, I really focus on with my customers on having CX success metrics mm -hmm. and having a sort of positive spin than a KPI or a SLA. So I would have that in my little data stack, my tech stack. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, Bella, proactive analytics. What is that? Oh, okay. So with proactive analytics, you know who I am. You know a lot about me. So based on the customer life cycle, or my life stage with you as an organisation, you should know what I want. So for example, if you've sent me a letter a couple of days ago, I could be calling about that. Or if my loan, for example, is due to um, expire and I'm contacting you, I'm probably calling about that. So I think that um, you know proactive communication is really important. Um, proactive communication as well if something's going to cause me pain. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if I've missed a payment on something and I'm about to be charged a fee, I'd kind of like to know in advance because I might choose to do something about that then then get that fee. Mm -hmm. And I know that there's lots of, you know, triggers in organisations that can have, um, you know, that they can proactively reach out to customers. But if we walk into our customer's shoes, when would I like you to proactively reach out to me? Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean by proactive, really leveraging data and understanding our customers. But that then lends itself to that really individualised, personalised customer experience, that not one size fits all. So for your clients that really do want to paint this vision of if we invest in our customer relationships, if we're proactive, if we take care of them, if they've missed a payment, you know, we check on them. How do you do the ROI equation? Like has something specific worked for you that would work for an audience, you think? Some magic potion of the ROI model that their CFO can get behind? Yeah, I think the ROI model is actually linked back to, um, and this is where I've seen it work, looking at root cause analysis. So not just... Um, so understanding what the problem is, but then linking back to what the cause of it is, what the frequency of it is, who are the impacted customers. So um, one of the tools to leverage that would be, you know, linking your customer journey mapping to your reporting, finding your customer pain points, and then linking that to an ROI, mm -hmm. particularly if it's linked to churn. Mm -hmm. um, you know, churn always get. Um, you know, the attention of the CFO, mm -hmm. um, if we can minimise um, churn or increase wallet size. So if we can alt offer different services and products to our, our customers, and this is how we can do it, typically um, that ROI, um, you know, conversation is a lot easier. But really understanding your business and understanding your customers. Yeah. So churn is a big deal for agents too. Like in the U.S., agent churn is about 50%. It's really high. 
people don't stay in these contact center agent jobs long and they're unhappy. Um, you could tell in many customer service interactions that you've had, that our audience yeah. has had. What is the churn rate like in Australia? Is it good for those companies that have a good uh, retention yeah. rate? What are they doing? Um, yeah, high. Um, you know, on average around 40% plus in that space. Um, the other thing around um, churn, and I always think about this holistically, I find that organisations that tend to have higher churn have a high rate of unplanned absences, so unplanned leave, mm -hmm. and the impact that has on the organisation. So, um, you know, considerations then go back to how do we, um, you know, look at speed to competency and see if we can get our agents um, doing certain tasks as soon as they can rather than having these long training programs where they learn a lot about everything and then they're sort of put out onto the floor. So how can we give them sort of um, certain tasks, activities, skills? And you can see that in, you know, in routers with skill-based routing, how do we factor that in? How do we look at employee experience, whether it be, you know, reward and recognition programs um, controlling that attrition. So I always believe there's positive attrition. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, um, people, you know, it's best for them and the organisation for them to seek excellence elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, how do we focus on identifying that really quickly? And then with the um, people um, that we know we want to grow and prosper and get promoted within an organisation. So a lot of the churn um, in Australia, and I don't know if it's like this in the US, is that our contact centres are seen as a great training environment for roles internally. So I see some organisations put business rules around the person has to be in that contact centre role for 12 months before they're promoted internally. But if they are promoted internally to keep them interested, how can we continue to educate them, develop them and really nurture them so when they take their next step, they can, you know, they're well equipped to do so. But those challenges have been, in, I've been in contact centres for 20 years, so since I was five, um, and attrition has always been um, an issue. Um, engaging staff has always been an issue on how you really do that. Um, and we can have those broader reward and recognition programs. I've seen things like gaming, um, but really sort of understanding the individual um, employee and what motivates them is something that's important. Um, yeah. For example, one um, space, we actually ran workshops aligned to implementing CX. We focused on EX and we said, how would you like to be rewarded for doing an awesome job? What would make you tick? And the things were really interesting. Like, I just want to leave half an hour early on a day that I choose, or I'd like to come in late if it's my daughter's birthday. So some of the things they had mentioned were really quite tangible. Mm -hmm. um, the other sorts of things they mentioned were, were I'd like to w spend a day in another area where we work really closely with so I can see what it's like from their perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think that's great. I think that should be part of induction. But, um, you know, to really sort of speak to them and go, what is it that you like? Because not everyone likes their names in lights, like their, you yeah. know, their name on a contact yeah, centre. that's a good point. Award for yeah, that's a good point. Um, when you think about the ROI question that we talked about, you mentioned churn, but what about the flip side of that? Have any companies that you've worked with been able to connect higher sales and growth with better customer experience? Um, uh, definitely, they'll find that their more high performing teams have um, better sales results. Um, so if we look at sort of sales and service, the better performing staff members have higher sales, their ability to cross sell, upsell is usually better. And then on the servicing perspective, um, people, um, agents who are high performers tend to have lower handle times, average handle times, and better first contact resolution rates. So you can definitely see that um, equation. But a key thing around, um, you know, centres where I feel like they're starting to be switched in, is they're tuned in, tapped in. There's a quality management framework established. There's regular coaching of staff members. Mm -hmm. You know, training and development of staff is taken really seriously. That's something I have seen in high-performing teams. And also high-performing teams, when we run um, CX leadership coaching, you know, you're only as strong as your weakest link. So we need to think about 
the full sort of spectrum of people. So these people here who are performing well, how do we continue to motivate, stimulate, recognize that? Those in between, where are they at their journey? How can we help them? And those that are not performing, how do we have those difficult, for some, performance conversations? Mm -hmm. uh, generally speaking, culturally, Australians don't like conflict. <laughs> yeah. So um, we are really, want, we want to please you. We will always say yes if we can. We want to say yes. Mm -hmm. So it's getting that balance right. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that's true. Um, well, is there one takeaway tip that you have for our audience that you really just would like to see practitioners do more of a note to kind of conclude on before we get into our rapid fire? One tip that you think will be successful for people? I would say that you need to be tenacious. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you have some bad days. That's fine. You need to celebrate the wins, celebrate the milestones, find things to celebrate on the journey because I feel like the destination never arrives because we move the goalposts with new technologies, new changing customer expectations, you know, competitor um, movement. So, you know, you need to be tenacious and just focus on the positive along the way and take that time out to celebrate that. I love that. And with teams. That's a great note. Yeah. Celebrate and be tenacious. I think that's a really important thing as well, Bella. Let's get to know you a little bit and um, do some rapid fire. Are you ready to do some quick questions? Let's do it. All right. Well, it's morning in Australia right now. It's afternoon for me. What's the most important part of your morning routine? Um, walking my dog to get a coffee with my husband. We just got married in March and our mornings together are really important. Congratulations. That coffee in Australia is so good. Yes. Glad white, and right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. What show are you currently streaming right now? We're streaming multiple because um, I've just had foot surgery. So I've had way too much time with my feet up. Wow. Um, Bosch is a bit of a favorite at the moment. Um the chill out can watch again in the background, Big Bang Theory. Mm -hmm. So they're probably two that immediately come to mind. What is one leadership hack that helped get you to where you are today? I love people. Mm -hmm. I listen to people. Mm -hmm. And it's really simple. I do what I say I'm going to do when I do it. So I create the expectations that I try to meet and exceed, hence exceed global. Mm hmm Absolutely. Um, what do you do to relax at the end of a hectic day? Uh, drink champagne or Tasmanian sparkling in my courtyard, watching my waterfall with my fish and my little ecosystem I've created. That sounds amazing. Um, mm. What is your favorite leadership book or resource? Um, I don't have one in particular. I know that sounds bizarre. I like to listen to people and one thing I do is anyone who I respect as a leader, I reflect on what traits I like about them and particularly when we do recruitment, that's really important to me to go, I'm putting this person with this leader and this is their leadership style. Mm -hmm. So I love to absorb, listen, um, particularly when we're coaching, you know, what traits do I really like? I like people who listen, um, who are future focused, who think holistically um, who work collaboratively with their peers. Mm -hmm. That's something for me that's really important, that success is for the company, they have that company viewpoint, that are not always thinking about their next role. All right. What is your idea of perfect happiness? Work or personally? Whatever you want. Um, personally, um, I'm extremely happy. So perfect happiness, I feel I have that now. Um, I would add health of a couple of people close to me who are not well at the moment. That would be perfect happiness. Um, work. I found my happy place at work. Um, I really like what I do. I mentioned before. So perfect happiness with work is that um, I can see CX working, whether it's something that I've been involved in a strategy or sort of had something, but also hearing stories from other people. Um, 
getting emails from people who have read my book and said, I really love this and I've done that and wow, or I'm really new to CX and you made it so easy for me. Mm -hmm. So hearing those stories for me is perfect happiness that I've managed to sprinkle um, CX fairy dust and globally. I love that. Well, I think that's a perfect note to end on, Bella. You, your book is really good. It is really good. Everyone should pick up a copy of Transform Customer Experience. Uh, Bella, if people want to get in touch with you or learn more about your services, where can they do that? Uh, yep, uh, is, uh, www.isabellaavalani.com or you can connect with me on LinkedIn. All right. Well, Bella, it's been such a pleasure meeting you. Thank you for getting up early to do this podcast. And hopefully we'll connect again Thank soon. You. If I'm ever in Melbourne, I will give you a ring. And if you're in LA, Come you see call me. me. Yep, I will definitely. And thank you so much for reaching out. It's been lovely interacting with you. Oh, you too. Everybody, you've been tuning into the Modern Customer Podcast. Thanks for watching and listening. Until next time.